Okay, can I get someone to tell me if they can see the screen? Make sure we're all good. You're good. Wonderful. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, thank you, Nicole, for introducing us. Thank you, Carol, for being an interpreter today. Um, I just wanted to give thanks again. Um, I know that some people probably will be trickling in because it is the lunch hour. Um, and so I kind of expect people to be trickling in when we're like a few slides in, but that's okay. I appreciate you all here, for you all being here today. And I'm just gonna kind of quickly introduce the title of our presentation, and then I'll give it to Lila for introductions. But um, we're gonna be talking about the new generation of working professionals, and we're gonna be introducing opportunities for mentorship and support. And we'll get into what that looks like moving forward. But quickly, I'll just introduce myself since I have the floor. Um, my name is Carmelita Sanchez, like Nicole said. Um, I'm currently the care support manager at the CARES Counseling Center. Um, and I'll get, hand it over to Lila so she can introduce herself as well. Thank you, Carm. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for that great introduction. And thank you, Carol. Um, so I think I know most of you, but for um, those I may have not met yet, um, my name is Lila Maestas, and I am the Assistant Director for the Center for Professional Development and Career Readiness. Um, I love Highlands. Highlands is my home. Um, I just love the culture here. I love, you know, the, the togetherness that we have, you know, um, just everything about Highlands and, you know, just the way... Um, we treat each other like family here. Um, you know, when Carm asked me to do this talk, I was a little bit hesitant, but um, I just want to thank her um, for getting me out of my shell, getting me to do this with her. Um, and I, I really appreciate you, Carm. So yeah, um, <clears throat> although we both uh, serve, you know, on different roles here on campus, Carmel Carmelita and I both share a passion for helping students reach their professional goals. Um, and so, you know, we both have a background in business and we decided to team up with our unique career perspectives to educate others about the new generation of working professionals and how we can support their development and transition into the workforce. Um, so on today's agenda, um, we will talk about the new generation of working professionals, you know, who they are, what their values are, um, we will then show you some trends and data pertaining to this demographic. Um, and then we're going to talk about ideas for opportunities for mentorship and, um, and support for future generations and how we can best support them. Um, and then finally, we're going to bring it all back together and close it off by talking about why this matters to employers and uh, future generations. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lila, for introducing us and giving everyone a, a taste of what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, like Lila mentioned, our first kind of topic of discussion is introducing who the new generation of working professionals are that we're referring to in this in this title today. Um, so who we're referring to is Generation Z. Uh, like Nicole said, I happen to be a member of Generation Z. This is a topic that I really enjoy talking about because I feel like I have a unique perspective being able to be a working professional and also just a recent student so I can kind of understand both um, angles and I wanna kind of bridge that gap. And that's what hopefully what we'll be able to do here today. So getting started, um, who's Generation Z? I mentioned I'm a member, but who, um, who are the people that make up this generation? So Generation Z involves individuals who were born between 1997 and 2012. Um, now some sources that I found and some sources you might see if you look up you know, the distinctions of the generations, um, they might say like 1997 to 2010, some might say 1996 to 2012, 2010. So it varies a little bit, but generally speaking, uh, 97 to 2012, was the source that we found was most accurate and most um, consistent. So um, right now, because they are born in that, that age period, uh, they make up over a, a little over 24% of the population currently. And this means that they're starting to enter the workforce more predominantly. So if you think about 1997, that makes the oldest Gen Z member around 27 years old right now. So anyone between the ages of 18 to 27, if you have a worker between those ages, they're a Gen Z working professional, and this might be relevant to you, um, especially alumni or community members who might, um, you know, own businesses and be working with this demographic now or in the future. Maybe this um, information will be helpful for you so that you can um, give your employees what they need and maybe just understand them a little bit better. So um, after clear defining them, I also want to point out what their values are. So yeah, we know who they are, but what do they value? Who is this generation? What about them should we know? So after doing some uh, research and 
uh, of data collecting, we basically were able to narrow down some of the big things that they value as a whole in terms of life and in the workforce. So Gen Generation Z really prioritizes mental health, uh, financial security, opportunities for growth in the workforce, um, you know, equity, advocacy, independence, being able to uh, speak for themselves, and of course, evolution evolution in terms of, you know, moving forward in the future, and of course, technology, because this is a big skill of Gen Z, as we all know. So um, I hope that kind of gives some insight as to, you know, where they're at, um, who they are. And I wanted to kind of include this little quote at the bottom to kind of set that tone about this demographic that we're talking about. So I'll go ahead and read that. Uh, this generation has entirely unique perspective on careers and how to define success, both in life and in the workforce. And I wanted to give you guys a little bit more. I'll go ahead and move forward. Um, in, in addition to just kind of defining them for you, I also wanted you to, again, understand them a little bit deeper. So yes, now we know what they value, who they are, but maybe you wonder why they value these things. Why is this generation um, different than the ones before um, and relevant for us to have a discussion about? So some things that we found, you know, into answering and doing the research for why does Gen Z have this outlook on the workforce and, and the economy, the world in general, um, is things like the growing wealth gap between income groups, the rising non-discretionary expenses, you know, inflation is a big one, a dramatic rise in higher ed, this also means, you know, higher tuition rates, uh, increasing rates of poor mental health. Of course, we saw a really um, big uptake after COVID, but especially with our college age students, that's, you know, what I do in my work, I look at that, and that the college age students is Gen Z right now. And they also are seeing this normalized dissatisfaction in the workplace from the generations before them that are, have already been in the workforce. Um, you know, there's this like stigma that, you know, if you're just not happy with your job, you just so you just deal with it and that's just the way that it works. And I think that Gen Z, um, based off the data and research we collected, we can kind of um, inquire that they are seeing these things um, and that's what's kind of driving them for more and for better. They're not one to settle. They want more than this. They, are, they don't want to be financially insecure. They don't want to have poor mental health in the workplace and they don't want to have just overall dissatisfaction. And they're speaking for that. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and throw it back to Lila. She's gonna go over some trends and data. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some uh, data that we found, um, and then we'll kind of take a deeper dive into that. So we found that by 2030, Gen Z will make up 30% of the workforce, um, contributing significantly to reshaping the workplace. Uh, the new generation of working professionals, particularly uh, Gen Z and millennials, um, are deeply focused on finding purpose in their careers. So unlike previous generations that may have prioritized financial stability, or job security above all else. Um, today's workers are a little bit different in that they're increasingly seeking roles that align with their personal values and passions. Um, another, uh, you know, a study done by Sherm found that 61% of Gen Z respondents said that they would strongly consider leaving their current jobs if offered a new one with significant, excuse me, significantly better mental health benefits. Um, so mental health and well-being are top priorities for Gen Z. Um, they expect employers to offer mental health resources, prioritize well-being, and create supportive, stress-free work environments. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we also found that one in five students say that they don't have a mentor because they don't have access to a formal mentorship program. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And mentors, you know, they provide this invaluable, you know, guidance to students. You know, they they support them. They provide wisdom. Um, they help students navigate through challenges. They help them to make informed decisions and avoid common pitfalls. Um, mentorship also offers students the opportunity to develop critical thinking skills, um, such as networking, um, communication, and problem solving that are essential for their career progression, right? And so a mentor can act as like a sounding board, you know, helping these students to gain confidence, uh, to build self-awareness and to explore their values, um, which are important for their overall growth and well-being. Um, and then finally, we found that over seven, or nearly 70% of 2024 graduates say that their student loan debt will impact which jobs they will pursue once they graduate. So this is another big statistic that we found. Um, so going forward, you know, we want to talk about, you know, our own ideas of opportunities for mentorship and support. Um, 
And we'll go over these in more detail as we go through the slides. But um, and again, you know, I just want to reiterate that these are just some suggestions that we came up with. Um, so, you know, we think that college mentorship programs are, you know, definitely helpful for students. And then once they're out working, um, you know, offering those employment, you know, uh, yeah, uh, offering employment, mental health resources, and then um, employment loan forgiveness programs as well. Thank you so much for that, Lila. And you might all be wondering, you know, uh, what the specific trends and data that we decided to include in this, um, like what those had to do, they may, might have seemed maybe a little random to you, but hopefully now that we are introducing these ideas and suggestions, you'll see that, you know, we had intention and we're seeing these deficits and seeing, oh, well, there's ways that maybe we think that, you know, we can kind of uh, meet these students and these prof oh, future professionals or not current professionals where they're at. So like Layla mentioned, uh, college mentorship programs is our number one. This was our biggest idea. You know, it's nothing, none of them are revolutionary. They've been done before, um, but a uh, college mentorship program is not currently um, being done here at NMHU um, as far as we know. And in terms of our work, we're not, um, we don't have any uh, in uh, co like concrete plans right now to make one of those happen. But of course, we would love to see that happen in the future. Um, but, you know, this is something that we just wanted to suggest. We wanted to put out there. People can implement it into their own work in their own excuse me, their own work lives. Um, and we we provided some several examples of institutions that have already done this. Um, so places like Harvard University, they have an alumni student mentorship program. Stanford University has the Stanford Alumni Mentoring, um, also called SAM. And then a little smaller of a university is Northwestern University and they have their Northwestern Alumni Association Mentor Circle. And then Lila will kind of discuss the benefits of these programs. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, so, um, you know, as we know, um, the benefits for these programs are really um, what makes the program so successful. Um, and so, you know, with college mentorship programs, again, it's an invaluable um, to the student. You know, they, they help to bridge the gap between academic learning and real world application. Um, these mentors, you know, they come in, they can provide students with personalized guidance, career advice, and networking opportunities that are often not things that are available in the classroom. Um, so these programs help students navigate, you know, the complexities of their chosen field, gain insights into industry trends, and develop the soft skills essential for career success, um, you know, such as communication, problem solving, and emotional intelligence. You know, working in career services, you know, I, I come across a lot of students, you know, they come into our office and they don't necessarily have the soft skills that employers are looking for. You know, they don't they don't communicate well, they don't make eye contact, you know, little things like this can that can make such a big impact when they're out there, you know, seeking jobs in, in the real world. Um, and these are things that we need to be teaching them and preparing them for. Um, mentorship programs also equip them, you know, with the tools, confidence, and the connections needed to thrive in their careers. So, you know, this makes it a, a critical component um, of the college experience. Definitely. Thank you so much, Lila, for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to our next idea and suggestion. I want to reiterate these are just, you know, mere suggestions that we see the shortcomings of how we can help uh, this future generation of workers. But of course, again, nothing new, but something important, employment, mental health resources. I know after COVID, these have become a little bit more easy to access. A lot more employers are implementing them for their employees. Um, but there's different ways that we can implement this for all our employees. And of course, it's going to benefit everyone, not just Gen Z. But we know that Gen Z holds this really high, um, high in value in terms of their employer. So there's micro level and macro level examples that we were able to find in our in our research. And I'll go over some micro ones. Uh, they include Google. They have uh, the employee assistance programs, which is something that I believe NMHU has as well. You basically can go in, excuse me, go in and get, um, you know, sign up and get uh, some free therapy sessions with uh, a therapist. Um, I believe it's like a certain amount a year. Um, Microsoft has something similar. They offer therapy. They also offer mental health days um, and subscriptions to mindfulness apps like Headspace. 
Starbucks has therapy sessions as well through a company called Lyra Health, and they give them about 20 sessions a year. So those are some more micro, probably easily accessible um, resources that employers might be able to implement a little faster for their employees just to give them that support. But some more macro level, you know, bigger picture things that some other employers, including Unlever, are doing, they're, they're having these mental health education and training, you know, um, uh, workshops and they're they're teaching their employees about mental health um, so that they really can grasp and understand what that looks like for them. Um, of course, there's peer support as well. And so it's uh, kind of destigmatizing. That's kind of what Johnson & Johnson is doing as well. They have a mental health initiative called Health Minds. Again, they're destigmatizing mental health, making it more regular um, in their work culture and making sure that everyone has access to the resources that they need. Same with Bank of America. They have a LifeWorks program um, where they, um, you know, focus on positive mental health community culture, again, destigmatizing and making mental health a priority uh, for all employees. Uh, the benefits of this, I, I don't think I have to tell you, but of course I will. Being, you know, the care coordinator, I'm 100% uh, always an advocate for mental health. Uh, uh, before I kind of go over those, I just want to add a snippet is, you know, I think I see the, the students at the, at the student level, I see our students come in and we have to kind of teach them, you know, to prioritize their mental health. But I think a big disconnect um, is that when a lot of these students and probably, you know, professionals in the past, they go into the real world and mental health's not taken as seriously as the way that we take it on college campuses. So we have to destigmatize that or the skills and the resources that we were able to give them throughout their college experiences won't really mean anything if they're not able to make sure to prioritize their mental health when they go out into the real world. Um, but of course, again, the benefits of, of having these mental health resources include things like improved mental health. Of course, if you suffer from any mental health um, you know, illnesses or not, uh, or just overall, of course, the reduced stigma of mental health, normalizing it, improving that work-life balance, which also um, increases productivity, it improves retention for employers, increased innovation and creativity, they'll do better work, more quality work, maybe more work in general, and just creating, again, that positive work environment, that positive culture. Uh, you know, we need to just destigmatize once again that mental health is just as important as every other health resource that we want our employers to have access to so that they can thrive. I'll throw it back to Lila. She'll go over our last one. Yes, yeah, so um, our third and final idea is the loan forgiveness programs. Um, and there are several organizations that have loan uh, forgiveness programs. So for example, CHEG is one of them. Um, they offer equity for education where they provide up to $5,000 for their employees annually. Uh, Live Nation is another one um, where they, um, they provide assistance of $100 per month to their employees. And then Kronos is um, another one where they provide $500 annually in assistance. Um, and of course, you know, every, these all have their own benefits, um, such as increased financial security, um, enhanced job satisfaction, attractiveness of employment, increased motivation, career development incentives, job satisfaction, enhanced work-life balance, and networking and community building. And, and there's so much more, but these are just a couple um, I also wanted to bring your attention to the quote that we found, uh, and it's down here at the bottom of the page. Uh, why wouldn't companies provide Gen Z workers with tools to strengthen their financial literacy? Reducing financial stress on young employ employees cuts down on distractions and positions them to bring their best to an organization. So this is this is really important, um, and you know, um, it it it's valued. So definitely, yeah. Thank you so much, Lila. Um, with that, we kind of wanted to bring it back around, like we mentioned, we do in the agenda. So we kind of want to give an overview, and we don't want you to feel like, you know, we got off topic. We're, we're talking about things that can support all um, employees, right? But why are these specific support opportunities that we're suggesting, why do they matter even more so for Gen Z workers? Well, um, if you think back, you know, to the slide that I kind of started off with, the values of Gen Z, we want to, again, reiterate that Gen Z really prioritize and values things like financial security, the mental health, diversity, equity, um, more so than the previous generations. Um, however, you know, when we were doing some research, if you want to take a look at the, the graph to the left side, um, we, we did become aware that it was the millennials that began showing interest um, in these specific values in terms of the workforce. You know, you'll see that millennials also see, um, you know, uh, 
a need for having a good work-life balance, even more so than Gen Z does currently also, just because Gen Z is a smaller uh, group of people right now in the workforce. But uh, millennials started this kind of trend of caring about these things. But so far, you know, with the research and the things that we were able to collect, uh, Gen Z so far is the generation to really actively negotiate for these things. You know, I think millennial was, the millennials were a little um, easier to fall into the crowd um, and Gen Z is actively negotiating for these issues. Um, and, and before I kind of turn it back to Lila to finish this up, I wanted to add just a little snippet and shout out to our colleague Leon, who sent us um, an article about that I thought was interesting um, about Gen Z workers getting fired more predominantly at a higher rate than other generations. And I kind of, you know, pondered that and thought, well, maybe it has to do with the fact that Gen Z is this, you know, um, generation that has stood their ground for once, which is very different than the norm. They're actively negotiating and they're not settling. And so they're speaking their mind, probably gets them in trouble a lot of the times. Um, so maybe that's why it's because Gen Z is not scared to kind of question the norm and stand up for what they believe in. Um, but I'll let Lila kind of finish it off with the rest of our thoughts. Yeah, so, you know, taking all of this into consideration, um, you know, we realize that it's not only up to Gen Z, but the generations after that, like, you know, Gen Alpha, to keep this ball rolling and to keep advocating for themselves. Um, you know, and in closing, you know, all, all we can say is for now, we need to just do what we can um, uh, to help these future generations. Um, and it's up to us to, it, excuse me, it's up to us to adapt um, and to contribute to the future generations of professionals um, through mentoring them and supporting them as best as we can. Um, we hope that, you know, the ideas presented to you have sparked some ideas for you and future generations and how we best can support our future of working professionals. Thank you so much, Lila. Like she said, we really just wanted to maybe spark some ideas and, and show that, you know, there's things that we can do now to kind of pave the way for the future and have a say so in that. So again, hopefully that did that for you. But here's our sources. I just wanted to kind of say that if you were interested in any of the data or the things that we discussed today, and you wanna like kind of look into what we found that, you know, just reach out to us and we can send you this list of sources um, if you're interested in this topic. Uh, we're more than happy to share that with you. And I'll let Lila say the final thank yous and ask for questions. Yeah, we just wanna thank you all for taking time out of your day to be here with us today. Um, you know, this is, we felt it was a good opportunity to, to kind of, you know, talk about this topic that's not talked about a lot, um, and to just kind of give you some insight about this new generation. Um, but with that, you know, we stand for any questions or comments you may have for us. Thank you. I'm gonna and try to see that. Please raise your hand or go ahead and just and try to weigh on those questions. Fantastic topic, ladies. I have two Gen Z's still at home. So <laughs> that was very well, insightful. I hope, I hope this gave you some more understanding of where they're coming from. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? I think we have one from Leon. Good afternoon. Okay. Great job. Great job, ladies. Oh my God, this was so great. And, um, as we're turning around more and more Gen Zs, as they're kind of getting advanced degrees and, and finding themselves in the workplace, right? There, there, there are a lot of Gen Zers who are no longer in entry level jobs. They're starting to pick up more of these like leadership positions. So we are going to see a massive change in structure. Um, I didn't realize that, what was it, 24, 25% of the working population right now are going to be Gen Z. Yeah, 24%. And they're going to be continuing, continuing to, to pop out. So um, one of the questions that I have is how did you all get a chance to look at how like general cost of living and just right now where we're at in the world, it's a lot harder to to make a to make a living, to sustain a living, right? A hundred thousand dollars a year um, now isn't the same it was 20 years ago. So is there any uh, data looking at how uh, you know these entry level jobs are, how much they're getting? and whether or not it's actually enough? And is that attributed to their general lack of um, I shouldn't say lack of, but their interest in negotiating for better opportunities for themselves. Uh, those, those are the types of things that I kind of think of because sometimes if they're not happy with where they're placed, is it because they're not making enough? What are the reasons why they're not happy outside of the job itself? 
100%. I think like, you know, that that um, slide that we kind of introduced that idea that there are rising non-discretionary expenses and that the wealth gap is is widening was kind of alluding to that. Of course, we didn't go into immense detail because um, it probably would have turned into an entirely different conversation. But you're right, Leon, that's exactly like one of these issues. And that's why that financial security piece, I think, is so big to the generation is because, you know, some of them might not ever be able to afford a house in the current economy that we live in. And of course, that's going to uh, determine whether or not they take this entry level job or they're shooting for the stars and trying to go for something uh, more that, that they feel is their worth because they won't be able to afford that. So, no, we don't have specific data, but of course, I would love to look into that as well. Um, you know, Gen Z is definitely a, a topic of mine that I really enjoy looking into because I'm I'm living this experience. Right. I'm I'm right there with them going through that as well, um, finding those financial um pieces are a big part of the puzzle. And sometimes the jobs, while although great, or maybe something that I love, maybe just might not cut it, right? So thank you for that question. I don't know if that answered it, but I'm just right in agreement with you. I don't know if Lila has anything to add to that. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, I, I did see some data and it's not coming to me now when we were looking. And, and like Carmen said, like this could have this could have been like a huge presentation because there's just so much out there and we kind of struggled, you know, trying to narrow it down and, you know, find um, or, you know, figure out what we wanted to bring to this presentation. Yeah, I, th I think it's kind of interesting too, because when I'm, I'm looking at the time difference, when I was in maybe Carm's position, right, a lot of millennials were actually living at home with their parents. So I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if some of these same things are happening um, as they're trying to kind of maintain their their or develop their their professional um, landscape, but yeah, this is this is very inspiring. I'm I'm actually very curious to know a little bit more about this. So definitely check out some of those resources. Yes, thank you so much, Leah. I knew that you'd have a question for us. So thank I'll you, Leah. <laughs> Are there any other questions or maybe comments? Nothing here. I don't see anything in the chat. Don't be shy. This is an inspirational set of young ladies here that we can learn a lot from. So if you have questions, please just come off mute and ask away. Oh, believe my mother. I'll count my mother <laughs> the question in the chat. They're always supporting me. I'll read it out loud for everyone. You mentioned that millennials started the trend for improving work-life balance. Do you believe that between millennials and Gen Z, they will convince Gen X and the baby boomers to finally realize how important mental health is? It is up to all of us to really make this a, a topic of discussion. Yes, thank you so much, mom. I talk about this with her all the time. She's always helping me with my presentation. So she knew exactly what I was gonna talk about today. Um, but yes, I do believe that. I think that Gen Z and millennials, um, because they shared this, this um, the same ideas and hopefully Gen Alpha will as well, that we gotta be the generations that kind of band together and reshape the way that we think about mental health, especially in the workplace. Again, I think COVID really helped us in that regard because it showed everyone that anyone can struggle with mental health issues. Um, and it's not just like a generational thing and we're not just being sensitive. It's it's a big thing that everyone has actually had to deal with and now it's kind of came to the limelight. So I do hope that Gen Z and millennials can really work together to show them this. Um, I think that in terms of evolution, we're, we're heading in the right way. Um, I hope that these mental health resources will kind of get wider so that we can get access to that. And of course, that's my big thing is mental health. Um, Lila, do you have anything to add to that? for a second. I think she's having some technical difficulties. We'll circle back to you, Lila, to add to that. I do have uh, Dean Parbotia with her hand raised. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to shout out to the two ladies, both of them alumni from the School of Business, Media, and Technology. Great job. Thank you. Did you have anything to add, Lila, to that? Um, no, I was just going to say, like, this is part of, like, um, I guess, like, the advocacy piece, you know, we have to continue to advocate for, for each other um, and for this next generation um, as they come into the, the workplace. Um, 
as it pertains to mental health, because they do value that. And, you know, they're going to keep pushing forward with that. So, um, yeah, I, I think that eventually, you know, people will start to realize that it is an important matter um, that we do need to take serious. Thank you so much. I think we have another question in the comments. Um, I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so going? Elizabeth is asking, how do you think a mentorship program could look at main campus and across centers? Do you see this as a next step or for young professionals working as staff at NMHU? So, um, you know, this has been something that, you know, has been brought up before. Um, and this is something we would love to do. Uh, we just, it, it's kind of just an idea right now. So we really don't have, you know, like a plan in place or anything like that. But um, I'd say let's talk. I mean, we, we would love to implement a program like this. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be really beneficial to our students. Um, you know, as I talked about some of those key points, you know, um, there's there's benefits that they don't get in the classroom that they could get out of this type of program. Um, and, you know, other schools are already doing it. So, you know, if other people are doing it, then, you know, I think we should too. I'm in 100% agree and so flat there. And we knew that someone was probably going to ask a question like this, like, you know, what's the next step? And yeah. we don't necessarily have the answers for that. But, you know, again, it's something we would love to see and be a part of. I, uh, Leon, I think a, a phrase this word for me, but he likes to call me the Gen Z consultant. And I, I love to be, again, that that middle ground in terms of staff and our students um, to kind of help us communicate and understand each other better. I also wanted to say, I just love that suggestion at the end, like for uh, making this a program for the young working professionals. Yeah as at, at, as staff members at NMHU. Um, I, I thought back when you mentioned that to the talk that I gave for Women's Day, not this past year, but the year before, um, it was about being a young professional and that transition and how hard it was for me, it still is. Um, and I talked about that very candidly. And I remember that Dr. Blaine, I believe Dr. Parvatia as well, uh, had mentioned like, you know, we should start some type of program to mentor the young professionals um, who are coming in because they, they could really grow from that. So I think that that would be a wonderful idea to not only to extend it to our students, but also those ones who are, you know, maybe alumni that are still at our institution in some capacity and making sure that they're getting that mentorship and that support that they need to to thrive as professionals because that's the ultimate goal in them coming to college right is to make sure that they are good working professionals when they leave so thank you so much for that question hi felicia oh felicia i don't i think you're muted I just wanted to commend both of you on a great presentation and kind of like build off what the conversation that was just taking place about mentorship. Sarah and I were both listening to this presentation and we both talked about like how our mentors were um, very crucial in our success and, you know, ability to move forward and complete school. So I was like, it'd be wonderful to also uh, sponsor that kind of program out of our CARES office um, at some point. I know we have to build capacity, but yeah, we need mentors. One in five is very concerning that one in five students have mentors. So thank wow. you. Oh, so, so informative. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you, Felicia. Really shout out to you because you're one of my mentors. Leon, you're one of my mentors. Dr. Tabatia, um, you know, Dr. Blea, I don't think she's here today, but all of my big, my big immense, um, you know, Lila herself, she helped me to finish grad school. Like, Everyone here in some way has like supported me and you're supporting me right now. And that's the only reason I'm able to stand up here today and, you know, advocate for other students who maybe don't have that same support system that I did to be able to get where I am today. So thank you. I just want to say thank you to all my mentors, Lila, especially you for uh, being my mentor, oh. <laughs> my co-partner in this. Thank you, Carm. I appreciate you so much. Yes. And thank you to everyone. We appreciate all of the support. We thank you so much. Are there any other questions? We need any more questions. Lots of great comments in the chat. 